So recall in Euclid's elements, we started off with five postulates. So postulate one says that through any two points, there is a line. Postulate two says you can extend your lines indefinitely far. Postulate three says that if you're given a point and some distance, you can create the circle centered at that point with radius the given distance. So if that's your R, you can form that circle. Postulate four says all right angles are congruent. So that right angle is the same as that right angle is the same as that right angle. And postulate five was a parallel postulate, which the way Euclid framed it says that if you have these two angles, alpha and beta, that sum to less than two right angles, then eventually these lines will meet on the same side, where alpha and beta sum to less than two right angles. They'll have to intersect. Okay, and there are several equivalent ways you can frame that, but that's how, that's how Euclid did it. And one might wonder, where do these postulates come from? And remember, when Euclid was working, he, he had in mind his straight edge and compass. So through any two points, why can you draw a line? Because, well, you can line up a straight edge right there, and you can just draw the line along the straight edge. And, and why can you extend a line segment definitely far away? Right? You can always put your straight edge on it and go a little bit further, right? And, and how do you do postulate three? Well, you take your compass, you grab that distance, and, and you move it, and you copy it, and you create the circle. Okay, you might think postulates four and five have less to do with straight edge and compass, and on appearance they do, but, but remember you can construct right angles just using straight edge and compass, right? If you, if you take a little line segment with your straight edge, and then you pick, you know, some, two, uh, you know, some, some arbitrary points, you can copy that distance, draw the circle, draw the circle, draw the line segment through those, you cover a right angle. So there's a standard way to get right angles from just straight edge and compass. And then this last one maybe takes a little bit more thought, but you know, I think, I think one can convince themselves if you work on straight edge and compass, this, this seems to be the case. I mean, it is, it's, an, it's an odd one precisely because you know, there's a long history of, of people fighting about if this really should be a postulate or not. But, but at least you see there's some deep connection between the postulates and straight edge and compass. And that's why all throughout, all throughout the text of the elements, what Euclid is doing is he's constructing things. Like he's proving things, but, but he's proving things via construction. And, and it's like, yes, there's one story where he's proving things by, by going up to back to the postulates, but there's another story where he's just constructing whatever he can construct with straight edge and compass. And so the question I want us to ask is, what can we construct? What can we construct with straight edge and compass. And so today we're gonna to begin answering this question by thinking about just what points can we recover with a straight edge and compass. But, but we're not going to follow Euclid's approach in the elements. Rather, we're going to try and bring things up to date a little bit. So we're going to jump from, you know, from BC to the 1600s with Descartes. And, and we're going to look at how Descartes engaged this question. So, so recall Descartes is the one responsible for developing this notion of the Cartesian plane. So Cartesian is named after, after Descartes where the Cartesian plane is you just think about your, your geometry happening in a plane, but, but you put some labels on this plane. So you give it an axis, an x-axis, and a y-axis, and then any point in the Cartesian plane can be labeled by whatever its corresponding x value and y value is. So if its x value is a and its y value is b, in the Cartesian plane it's just the point a, b. Yeah. 
Okay. And, and in the Cartesian plane, you might think, okay, wh what's going on with, with drawing straight edges? Well, well, drawing a straight edge is, is, is just, you know, use a straight edge to draw some line. We, we now have another way of thinking about lines in the Cartesian plane. We get equations for a line. So, so a line, you know, this, this is high school, right? This is like algebra one or something in high school, I mean, pre-algebra. You learn a, y, a line is of the form y equals mx plus b, where your m and b are some constants, your slope and your y-intercept, and your x and y are variable. And then with your compass, what are you doing with your compass when you go and you draw a circle? Well, my circles, So, so here my m is my slope, and my b was my y-intercept. With your circles, if you have some center at some point, let's say a, b, and you have radius r, do you remember the equation of the circle? Yeah, x minus a, squared plus y minus b squared is equal to your radius squared. And like you should take a second like convince yourself that's, that's correct if you don't remember this. And so you can just draw, draw a little circle of radius r. And well, you can at least like check that some points are on there that should be on there, right? Like, like at the point a, b, well, if you add a, b, you get zero equals r squared. That's not a solution, so, so that's not a point on there. But like this guy, which is like r to the right should be on there, or r to the left should be on there. Why? Because if you just go r to the right or r to the left, your b, your y value is still at b, so this would be zero. And here you have a difference of just r, so you have radius squared is radius squared. So those points on there, these points are on there, and then you can think a little bit further about why you get the rest of the circle as well. But, but this is high school, right? So we're not, gonna, we're not gonna spend time on this. I'm just gonna assume we remember this discussion. I mean, the Cartesian plane is how you first learn about geometry in high school, but it's actually a huge innovation. This is not how the Greeks thought about it. The Greeks do not think in terms of these equations. I mean, algebra wasn't developed yet, right? So, so they couldn't think in these terms. But Descartes, he started thinking of these terms and he says, you know, this revolutionizes, this revolutionizes how we do geometry. So, so here's Descartes' insight. Let's say you were to just begin with two points. So, so you have some two points, you know, P, and, and Q. Now, now you want to run to the races, you know, Euclid would want to say there's a line through it and start constructing various things from those two points. And like, yeah, you can do that. But the Cartesian way to think about this is saying, okay, if there's two points, we can imagine them living in some plane. So, so we can stick a plane on there. Okay, so, so I'm going to give some coordinates to this. I'm going to give some x coordinates and some y coordinates. Now, I drew one of the points out of the origin, and I drew the other point here. And you might think, like, there could be you know, any arbitrary distance between them. Like, maybe they're like pi away from each other, or maybe they're like you know, 17 away from each other. But, but we want to limit ourselves. To, to the kinds of like power that Euclid would have had. And Euclid doesn't have any notion of distance. Right? We're going to develop, we're going to, we're going to start talking about distance in a second. But, but like when he's using his ruler, it, it's not actually a ruler, it's just a straight edge. There's no measure on it, right? So, so if you're just given two points, you know, you can't, you can't say like they're pi apart or they're, you know, 17. You don't know how far apart they are. So, so we're going to have to assume these two points are just, well, well, whatever that length is, we're going to make that length our unit length. We're going to say, in, in our geometry, this, this length here represents one, because it's the only length that we have. 
And, and so if we let that be one, okay, then, then we can start talking about what it means to be length two and what talks means to be length seven or whatever. But, but the point is, like, no lengths are given to us. We, we have to first introduce a unit. And, and so when you begin with two points, you might as well assume the two points you're beginning with are zero, zero, and one, zero. And then the question becomes, what other points can you get using straight edge and compass? So, what else can we get using just straight edge? And compass. What other points can we get using your straight edge and compass? So you help me out now. We have zero, one, uh, zero, zero, and one, zero. What else can we get using the straight edge and compass? That starts simple. Oh, yeah, so give me something simple. Yeah, 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 great. So, so the claim is you should be able to get anything of the form n0, where n is a natural number, or maybe you'll be a little more ambitious and build up to, to integers. Well, let's just begin with n being some natural number, n0. So like, how do you do that? You know, if I have, if I have 0, 0, and I have 0, 1, uh, one 0, how do I get 2, 0? Tell me exactly what I would do with my compass and straight edge to recover two zero. Well, first, first I probably want to extend this line. So I'll use my straight edge to extend the line, which, which notice corresponds with postulate two of Euclidean geometry, right? So, so I'm just extending the line with my, with my straight edge, and then what do I do? Yeah, I, I draw a circle centered at one zero, with radius one, that reaches back to zero, zero, and I just come over here and I see where that circle hits, hits this line, and so I know that will also be of unit length, and so this is at two, zero. And then I can repeat that process to get three, zero, and so forth. So, so I can at least get all, all numbers of this form. Am I doing something wrong? No, we're happy? Okay, so what else can I get? Zero yeah, that's right. It's like we've been living on just the x-axis, but I can move to the to the y-axis. So so let's get points of the form zero m, where where n is some natural number. So how are we going to do this? We we have these two axes. We've already talked about we can make a right angle, so we can make this second axis. I'm at I have zero zero, I have one zero, and I got the rest of these guys if I need them. How am I going to get zero one? I just stick my compass at zero, zero, make it radius one, come on up, whoop, and, and now I'm at zero, one, right? And then repeating the exact. Do you put down the edges in the natural numbers? Do you think M? Oh, yeah, this, this, is, this is an M that's a natural number. That's right. Okay, great. And then by the exact same argument as above, I can, I can just continue to copy this distance, use my compass up here to get 0, 2, and so forth. So I've got all those guys now. Okay, we will limit ourselves to the natural numbers, but there's no reason to limit yourself to natural numbers. You, you can extend this line in the other direction and, and then copy the distance to get negative 1, 0, and so forth. So, so in general, you can get all the n's that are in the integers. And same thing here, I can copy this distance and go, go negative. Zero, negative one. So I can get all the integers as well. Okay, now that I have n zero and zero m, what else can I build up? Yeah, I've got, I've got all these guys here now on the two axes, so what else can I get? Well, well, once I have like, you know, two zero and zero two, or three zero and zero two, I, I could always construct this point, you know, just, just construct a, a perpendicular here, and construct a perpendicular here, and I can recover the point three zero. 
How do I construct this perpendiculars? Well, it's, I just set some distance, whatever the distance I want to be. I, I go to equal distance on both sides, and then I construct a circle, and I look at where those two circles intersect each other. And you can draw your line to get the perpendicular. We know how to make perpendiculars, right? This is, this is a standard construction of geometry. So I draw the perpendicular, I draw the perpendicular, I see where they intersect. And that'll be at the point three, two, three, two. Okay, so, so I've actually given you us a way now to construct all points N, M, where N and M are integers, right? Okay, can we get anything else? You know, like, like, like can we get anything else? How do you get something that's not an intro? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, I mean, we, we, we know we can bisect a segment, right? So we can make a, a perpendicular bisector. And then if we drop a, a bisector right here with my compass and straight edge, so I draw a circle, I draw a circle, they intersect. I, I drop the perpendicular. I would get like the point one half, right? So, so I can get one half, and then I can have you know all all combinations of you know halves of integers. But you know you don't need to stop at a half. You could go to a fourth or an eighth or a sixteenth. So, so at least that gives you like now it's n over any power of two and m over any power of two. That's that's pretty good. But, but I claim we can actually recover all the rationals. So to do that, let me pause for a second. And I want to talk about operations. So suppose I have some length that's of length, I don't know, we'll call it A. Will that get confusing if I call it A? Mm, I don't want to call it X. I'll call it A. Hopefully that's not too confusing. This isn't just an x coordinate, but it's just some length, something of length a, right? So here it could be going from 0, 0 to a, 0, wherever of length a. And then something of length b. Then we know we can construct something of length a plus b, right? You just, you just take the line, you extend this line on a, and you copy this distance b onto it. And the result is something of length a plus b. OK. So we can do addition. So, so addition is something we can do. We can also do subtraction. You know, if you, if you have something of length a and you want to subtract b, you just copy b onto it. And then this little thing that remains is a minus b. Right? OK. Here we'll assume like magnitude of A is greater than the magnitude of B, but, but we, one could make sense if you like clue direction and things like this, what we mean by negative quantities. But for now, we'll just limit ourselves to A being greater than B, so this is a positive value. Okay, how about multiplication? Multiplication. Can you think of a way for us to multiply two quantities? If I, if I have some quantity A, and some quantity b, how could I ever get the quantity a times b? Yeah. Can you get, can we also have the units. We have the unit. Yeah, I mean, we started out with two points that gave us our unit. So you can always assume you have like the unit distance floating around somewhere. You know, you have those two original points that are unit distance. So we really have a, b, and the unit. Yeah, I mean, that's really important, right? Because we need to know if B is expanding A or shrinking A, right? Like, if B is smaller than the unit, A times B should be getting smaller. If B is bigger than the unit, A times B should be getting bigger. So, so this is only going to make sense if, if we have a unit defined. Okay, so how can we do this? If you have, if you have something of length B, you can draw perpendicular a segment of length 1. That gives you a triangle. You can then extend that segment to get a segment of length A. 
I'm then going to construct at the end of the segment a line that's parallel to this line. So construct a parallel line and see where it intersects this perpendicular. Then I claim that these two triangles are similar. They share a right angle, but since these lines are parallel, you actually know that all of the angles, corresponding angles, are equal. So they're similar triangles. So you should have that whatever this side length here is, whatever this mystery length here is, whatever this height is here, you know the height is to A as B is to 1. So then that gives you your height equals A times B. Yeah? So we recovered multiplication, A times B. How would I get division? Well, just change your construction around a little bit. Make this height B, and make this the unknown height H. Right, so you begin with some A and some B. You first draw this line, then you draw a line parallel, that's the height one, that's length one away, and we want to know what the corresponding height is. Now, your ratio will be height is to one, so your height, as B is to A. So we've just recovered division. Okay, so, so given segments, I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Given give me a length, I can add, subtract, multiply, or divide. And so what this means is like I can't only, you know, not only will I be able to figure out what length three is, what length two is, I can get length three halves, or 17 fifths, or, or whatever you want. So, so you end up with, Actually, we could cover all the points here where your m and your n are rational values. You know, you can, you can get some point like, you know, right here that's maybe at, you know, a little bit past 1. Maybe it's like 17 over 13 and it's like 1 half or whatever. You can recover all of your rationals. Okay. Cool. So we can get rational values. Can you get anything that's not irrational with just straight edge and compass? Okay, great. So, so it seems like there are some, some irrationals we can recover. How would you recover root two? Well, you can draw a triangle with side lengths one and one. Then we know by a right triangle of side lengths one and one. Then we know by Pythagoras, this side length has to be root two. So we recover root two. Can, can we get any other square roots? You, you have this nice, uh, well, how do you construct an equilateral triangle? We, we have a way to do this. So this is one of Euclid's first constructions in book one. You can make an equilateral triangle. Once you have an equilateral triangle, you then construct a perpendicular bisector of one of the sides. And then you have it that if, if this short leg was length one, and then you can um, show that this would be length two, and, and then you can argue that this has to be length three. Okay, that takes a lot of construction. So, so that takes a lot of work. And, and maybe we don't want to do this in a piecemeal way where like, we try to come up with a clever argument for each of these. So let's recover all the script. Um, oh, sure, sure, sure. So, so there's this fun trick where you have, one and one, which gives you root two. And then what you want to do is you want to draw something length one right here. No, no, no. No? Just take a segment, just take a segment that's of length one. On one side, you're going to take a perpendicular bisector. And then on the other side, you're going to take the arc of length two and see where it meets the perpendicular bisector. Well, I, I want to do this argument really fast. Because <laughs> I think, I thought this is what you were saying. And so then what is, what is the length of this hypotenuse? Yeah, it's two plus one, three, square root of, so square root of three. 
and then you can draw the, the perpendicular here, and then what's the, you know, the length of that hypotenuse? It's like you had a, you had a root three and you have a one, so you get, you get root four, which, which happens to be two. But, but you know, and then you draw, the, you, you draw the one here, and then you have a one and a root four, so that gives you root five. And you can continue this way to recover the square root of n for n a natural number. Okay, so, so there are lots of clever ways. I mean, this doesn't give you everything you might want, because what if you want to do the square root of like, you know, two-fifths or something, right? So, so here's, here's the construction I want to show you. Let's say you have some given length a. So, so here's some given, some given length a. And I want to construct the square root of a. A, you know, so far we can construct any rational value, so let A be any rational value. You know, A is anything you're able to construct so far. How can I construct the square root of A? Well, what I'm going to do is I also have a unit length. So let me add a unit length onto the end of this. So, so you might think this is laying along the x-axis where this point over here is like a point like negative 1, 0, and this point over here is just the point a zero. What I then going to do is I'm going to construct the semicircle that has these two points as ends. How do I do that? Well, I find the midpoint. So I come over here and I find the midpoint. What is that midpoint? Well, you know, my, my, my total length is a plus one. So, so half of this distance would be a plus one divided by two. So I started off a negative one, but I added to it a plus 1 divided by 2. So, so that's this point right here. And then I'm going to construct the, the circle. I mean, you, you could construct the whole thing. I just care about the top half. The circle of radius, the circle of radius a plus 1 over 2. So, so that's the radius of my circle. OK, we, we can describe the equation of the circle. So the equation of the circle is just x minus this x value that it's centered at. So that's x plus 1 minus a plus 1 over 2 squared plus y squared is centered at when y is 0. So just plus y squared is equal to radius squared a plus 1 over 2 squared. And then I, I want to know, if I'm here at the origin, so the, here's my origin, here's my 0, 0. What is the corresponding point on the circle? What is this corresponding point? My, my x value is still going to be 0, but what's the corresponding y value? Well, we just need to plug x in and solve for y. x equals 0 in and solve for y. So, so here I'm plugging in x equals 0. I end up with, that's just 0, so it's 1 minus a plus 1 over 2 squared, which um, factors out to 1 squared minus 2 times a plus 1 over 2 plus a plus 1 over 2 squared plus your y squared will be a plus 1 over 2 squared. These cancel. This is just a, a, a minus 2 times a plus 1 over 2. Those 2's cancel. The minus 1 and the 1 cancels, leaving you just minus a. So a comes over, and you're left with y squared equals a. So for this point up here, you're at the positive square root of a. So there's a construction that gives you the, the square root of any value. So once you've constructed any value a, you construct the square root of a. This is nice because it means that not only can we get the square root of 2, but we can also get the square root of the square root of 2, right? And not only can we get, like, you know, the square root of 2, but then you can get the square root of 3, then you can get the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3, and you can, you can square root that too. So, so, you know, now we can construct things like the square root of the square root of 2 plus the square root of 3, or whatever you want, right? To summarize, what can we construct with straight edge and compass? We've seen that we can construct with 
straight edge and compass anything obtained by either addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or square roots. Okay, obtained by these from what? Well, well, we started out with just two arbitrary points, which we said were unit length one away. So, so for us, we, we started out with, with, you know, starting with just one. If, if you have some other given points and you have some given distances, you can construct different things. But, but we're just asking, what if you just start with one? Well, with one, with just addition and subtraction, you can get all of the, all of the um, natural numbers and all of the integers. Multiplication still is just the integers. But then division gives you all the rationals. And then square root introduces a whole lot more possibilities. Any combination of square roots of rational numbers. Or square roots of square roots of, and so forth. OK. So, so you can repeatedly apply these operations as much as you want to get whatever you want. And, and those are the points we can draw, points that have these as the coordinates. So, so this is a result due to Descartes. And, and he was very pleased with this result. He has this comment where he says, you know, if the Greeks had known this, they wouldn't have made so many fat books. Because like, this, this is like pretty much gives you all of the elements. Or at least with the first four books of the elements. And so that's what I want to argue right now, is that this is actually a really powerful result. And so to do so, let's just think about some of the other things that the elements are concerned with. One of the things the elements is concerned with is, is, is not just length, but, but angles, right? Not just points and lines, but, but angles between lines. So, so let's think about what angles we can recover. When can we construct Angle alpha. Well, you know that if you have some angle alpha and and you like maybe work in a unit circle, say, work in a work in a unit circle, so this is some radius one you centered at the at the at the angle begins at the center, then you know, the coordinates of this point right here, so, so this is one as well, but the coordinates of this point right here will just be cosine alpha, sine alpha. Which means if you can construct alpha, you can construct cosine of alpha and sine of alpha. And then the converse is true too. If you can construct cosine of alpha and sine of alpha, you can construct, you can construct angle alpha. So constructing angle alpha is really the same as just being able to construct cosine alpha and sine alpha. And we know we can construct cosine alpha and sine alpha when those are values that are just the result of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square rooting of rational numbers. So, so what are some angles we're able to construct? Well, we've already seen one, right? You know, like, like why can we construct 45 degree angles? Well, one is we have an explicit construction of it. That's fine. But, but like more, more generally, you can make a 45 degree angle because a 45 degree angle corresponds to a sine of 45, which is what? Uh, root 2 over 2, right? Root 2 over 2 and a cosine of 45 degrees, which is root 2 over 2. So, so being able to construct a triangle with, with this angle corresponds with the values of the sine and the cosine. Or someone mentioned this like 30, 60, 90 triangle a minute before. So you know, like if you have a 30, 60, 90, uh, you, can make those, you can make angles of like degrees 30 degrees. So, so why can we do this? Well, you know, your sine of 30 degrees is, is just a half. So, so that's, you know, that's, that's here at a half and the Cosine is further out. Cosine of 30 degrees is just root 3 over 2. Right? 
So, so that's why we can actually construct like 45 and, and 30 degree angles. Okay. But, but it's more than just angles. In book four of the elements, Euclid becomes really concerned with, with trying to construct various uh, uh, regular uh, polygons inscribed inside of circles, right? Like the crowning achievement of the first four books of the elements is he constructs a regular pentagon. So let's think about, let's think about what's going on here. If, if I want to construct some, some regular polygon inscribed inside of, inside of my circle, what, what I need to do is, is I'm going to have a bunch, of, a bunch of segments like this, right? A bunch of segments like this. And, and you know, you may, you may continue to, to go around, and, and you know, so these will all be of equal length, and you try and construct whatever. You can construct a hexagon this way. Euclid will construct a, a, a pentagon. And you may wonder, like, can you, can you construct a seven-sided shape, or a, you know, a regular 11-sided shape, or so forth? Well, well, let's see which ones we can construct. If this is alpha, and this is some distance d, this is some distance d, we're treating this as a unit circle. Remember, there's a relationship between alpha and d. This is your law of cosines from high school. Law of cosines. So what does the law of cosines tell you? The law of cosines tells you that d squared is just these two side squares, one squared plus one squared. So it's like the Pythagorean theorem, but then there's a correction term, minus two times one times one, these side lengths times each other, times cosine of the opposite angle of D, cosine of alpha. Solving, solving for D, we can see that D is just the square root of two minus two cosine of alpha. So, so an angle alpha being constructible, you can construct alpha whenever you can construct D and vice versa. There's a relationship between D and alpha that only involves our operations. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square root. So you can construct one exactly when you construct the other one. So you can construct alpha. So, so this picture shows that alpha is constructible exactly when D is constructible. Right? Okay, so, so let's think about like some regular polygons and see what we can say. Let's think about the regular, regular decagon. Deca for 10, like decade. Regular decagon, regular 10-sided polygon. What, what would alpha have to be? Let's, let's think. So, so if I have my circle and, and I break it up into, into 10 equal angle parts right here for, for equal sides, each alpha would have to be what? There's 36, right? Just 36 degrees. In general, if you have a regular n-gon, each one will just be 360 divided by n degrees. And so I, the question is, like, can I make a regular decagon? Just comes down to, can I make a 36 degree angle? But making a 36 degree angle is equivalent to constructing whatever this corresponding length is over here. So, so let's figure out what that corresponding length would have to be in a unit circle and see if it's a length that only involves addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and square roots, right? So here we go. We, we have a 36 degree angle. Let, let me just draw this like maybe a little bit bigger. Blow this up a little bit. Here I have my 36 degree angle. I know these are both side length one, one and one. I'm in a unit circle. So, so since these side lengths are the same, that means I'm actually in an isosceles triangle. So, so what are these angles? Well, they have to add up to 180, so subtract 36, they have to add up to 144. So each one is 72 degrees. Each one is 72 degrees. I'm trying to figure out what this D over here is. I want to know what D is. Well, take one of these 72 degree angles and bisect it. So, so these angles are now equal to each other. Both of them would be 36 degrees. Well, since this is a 36 degree angle and this is 72, you know this other one has to be 72 as well. 
And this one up here is something awkward like 108 degrees. Okay. But in particular, since these are both 72 degree angles, this is an isosceles triangle. So this side length must be D as well. But we can say one more thing. This is a 36, 72, 72. The overall triangle was a 36, 72, 72. So this triangle here is similar to the large triangle. What that means is, is, is we have a nice, a nice correspondence that, oh, oh, maybe I can say one more thing about this. Yeah, so, so what does my correspondence give me? It gives me like this, this long leg here, D, is to this long leg here, 1, as this, this mysterious length x is here, as x is to D. But, but what is x? Here we have a 36, 36 degrees. So this is an isosceles triangle as well. So this length here must be D as well. So your X must just be one minus D. So this is just one minus D. Cross multiplying, we get, uh, I guess I can do it over here. D times D, D squared, is equal to 1 minus D. That is D squared minus D. No, D squared plus D minus 1 is 0. So then by a quadratic formula, I know that D must be equal to negative B, negative 1, plus or minus the square root of b squared 1 minus 4ac minus 4 times minus 1, so it's 1 plus 4, that's 5, all over 2. The, the minus would give you a negative value, which wouldn't make sense for our distance. So this corresponding distance here, this corresponding distance here, must just be 1 plus the square root of 5 all over 2. Well, that's something we can construct. Because we can construct 5, then we can construct the square root of 5, then we can add 1 to it, then we can divide it. So as you can just operations, D is constructible. Hence, 36 degrees is constructible. Hence, the regular, de 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 regular decagon is constructible. So, so this, is, this is Descartes like, celebrating. He's like, you know, all that work in the elements, it just follows like, very, very quickly. I mean, if you construct a regular decagon, then I claim like, it follows immediately that you can construct a regular Pentagon. How do you make your regular pentagon? Well, there's a couple ways to think about it. One is you can just make a regular decagon and pick every other point and connect those. Or you can think, to make a regular pentagon, I'm going to need 72 degrees. Right? But if I have 36 degrees, I can just, I can just add that to itself and recover 72 degrees. So, so angles, you can also add to each itself, or you can cut them in half. You can, you can do some nice things with them. OK, so you, you recover the construction of the regular pentagon. That's like the first four books of Euclid's Elements we just recovered on like a couple blackboards, right? So, so this is really powerful. And, and you should be pretty satisfied with it. But you, know, you might think that's where the story ends, but it doesn't end there. So this is like 1600s, they occur celebrating. But there's something like he, he didn't address. And, and it doesn't get addressed for another couple hundred years. What can't you construct? That's where we'll pick up next time.